Ariana Grande is a pint-sized vocal powerhouse. But she's almost as well known for her alleged diva antics as she is for her pipes. The one-time Nickelodeon starlet's difficult reputation as being rude to fans and impossible to work with has started to precede her. Here are some of her shadiest moments to date. Break Free Grande's been known to engage in some serious co-star conflict. Sam and Kat ended after just one season in 2013, and Grande's friendship with co-star Jeanette McCurdy was reportedly a casualty of the show's end, too. McCurdy skipped out on the Kids' Choice Awards in March 2014, citing alleged mistreatment from Nickelodeon and hinting that Grande was to blame for not standing up for McCurdy in contract negotiations. This led to some seriously shady subtweeting between the stars. Grande pointedly omitted McCurdy from a long list of thank yous she posted once the end of Sam and Cat officially came. Meanwhile, McCurdy wrote a post of her own all about how she had cut out a friend, and many fans believe that unnamed friend to be Grande. She wrote, We aren't better friends because being friends with you takes the better out of me. In fact, I might possibly be the worst version of myself when I'm around you. Where did I go? As far away from you as I can get. You won't be hearing from me anymore because, sweetheart, being a friend to you was doing so much more for you than it was doing for me. You sucked the life right out of me, and I want my life back. She'd later be a bit more diplomatic about the rift in an interview, saying, We butted heads at times, but in a very sisterly way. Like, she knows me so well, I know her so well. But it's not just people that know her who complain about Ariana Grande's attitude. Problem In 2011, Alexander De Leon, lead singer of The Cab, tweeted, Hope none of my fans ever have the displeasure of meeting at Ariana Grande, most stuck-up, disrespectful person I've ever met in this industry. And it wasn't the last time Grande would be publicly blasted for making a bad impression. In August 2014, one fan's father posted a blog about how rude Grande was to his daughters at a meet-and-greet. After his daughter won a contest by drawing a picture of Grande, the singer allegedly made no secret about the fact that she wasn't impressed. The furious father wrote, Grande approached her fans without a smile, just an icy look as she toyed with her hair. She was surrounded by eight to ten assistants. Ariana stood by with a blank stare. She spent perhaps 15 seconds with each of the prize winners. That is not an exaggeration. They took an approved photo with her and that was it. No small talk, no banter. She never bothered to even ask anyone their name. Then Jen took out one of the drawings that won the contest for her. Kelly snapped a photo of her smiling little sister giving Ariana the drawing. Delete those pictures, please, was all Ariana said. Ariana turned to her security and ordered, make sure she deleted those. Then Ariana Grande walked away from her prize-winning fans without even saying goodbye. Side to Side When Ariana Grande shows up to a photo shoot, she's notoriously got a laundry list of demands, chief among them being photographed in non-natural light and only on her good side. E! News correspondent Juliana Rancic confirmed the horror stories about her, saying that Grande's team shoved and bullied anyone in their way of getting Grande from her good side. She said, I feel like where there is smoke, there is fire. It was like you either get on the other side or we don't do an interview. It's one thing if it's Mariah Carey, but when you're new on the block, trying to earn your stripes? Maybe next time she should focus on showing off the good side of her personality instead of her face. Over and over again her recent relationships have been brimming with drama, too. When Grande first broke out of her Nickelodeon bubble, she dated YouTube star Jay Brooks. They had an ugly split in 2013, with Brooks taking to Twitter to accuse Grande of cheating with Nathan Sykes, who was then a member of boy band The Wanted. Grande then openly dated Sykes, with whom she duetted on Almost Is Never Enough and over and over again. How he handled it was a bit unexpected, but, um... Their relationship conveniently lasted from just before their single debuted to just after it flopped on the charts, at which point she reunited with Brooks. But that didn't last long either. She and Brooks split again in 2014. After that, she was part of another juicy celebrity love triangle when she started dating Big Sean, with whom she collaborated on her smashes Right There and Problem. That relationship had a sketchy beginning. They allegedly first got together when Big Sean was still engaged to Glee star Naya Rivera. Rivera dished about finding the two together in her memoir, writing, We'd been fighting for five days straight while he was traveling, and then on the one day that he was back in LA, he said he didn't want to see me. I walk in to Big Sean's house, go downstairs, and guess what little girl is sitting cross-legged on the couch listening to music? It rhymes with Smariana Schmande. Time to lick the donuts. In 2015, on the 4th of July, no less, Grande and her then-backup dancer boyfriend Ricky Alvarez went to a donut shop where she was rude to employees. She was captured on camera saying, I need a donut professional in here. But then it got so much worse. She was caught on camera licking a tray of donuts for which she hadn't paid. And then she muttered, What the f is that? I need a I need a 
When she was called out on it later, she released a statement that said, I am extremely proud to be an American, and I've always made it clear that I love my country. What I said in a private moment with my friend who was buying the donuts was taken out of context and I am sorry for not using more discretion with my choice of words. I apologize if I have offended anyone with my poor choice of words." The comment also lamented American obesity and demanded that the rest of the nation do better. Nice. But her non-apology didn't sit well with everyone, so she tried to make it right again by saying, "...I feel like um, seeing a video of yourself behaving poorly that you have no idea was taken is such a rude awakening." Grande kept the camera rolling as her second donut apology continued over the next two and a half minutes. It's like you don't know what to do. I, I was so disgusted with myself. I wanted to shove my face in a pillow and wanted to disappear. But instead of that, I'm gonna come forward and own up to what I did and take responsibility. After everything else, Ariana's bizarro donut incident may have finally left a bad taste in some people's mouths. Justin Timberlake is a successful musician who's also managed to make his mark in the movie industry. But his rise to fame has also been tinged with tons of tabloid gossip about his relationships and behaviors behind the scenes. From wardrobe malfunctions to manufactured drama, here are all the times JT has been out of sync. Bad Breakup Justin Timberlake dated Britney Spears when they were both still at the top of their teen pop stardom, but their breakup was ugly in more ways than one. After the split, Timberlake did an interview on 2020 in which he revealed that he had, in fact, been intimate with Spears, even though the singer had told the press she planned on remaining a virgin till marriage. For her part, Spears was not happy with Timberlake kissing and telling, and said, "...it was two years into my relationship with Justin, and I thought he was the one, but I was wrong. I didn't think he was gonna go on Barbara Walters and sell me out." Despite her embarrassed reaction, however, Timberlake continued to bring up his bedroom history with Spears and even included a reference to it in his Saturday Night Live sketch half a decade later. "...I'd like to think that, at first, he dates a popular female singer. <laughs> Publicly, they'll claim to be virgins, but privately, he hid it." And Timberlake wasn't done punishing Spears with just words. He went on to drop the passive-aggressive pop track Cry Me a River about a cheater getting her comeuppance. He even cast a Britney Spears lookalike and had his new Paramore rock a halter top and low-cut pants just to make sure no one missed the memo on who that song was about. Blame Game Although Justin Timberlake had a direct hand in the wardrobe malfunction heard around the world, he shouldered very little blame for the accidental exposure incident. In 2004, while performing the Super Bowl halftime show with Janet Jackson, the routine concluded in him pulling at a piece of her costume to match his lyrical promise to have her, quote, "...naked by the end of this song." It's hard to tell what the intent was with him tugging at her top that way, but the move left Jackson's jewelry-adorned nipple open for millions of viewers to gawk at, and the fallout was massive. Hundreds of thousands of complaints were filed with the FCC, and CBS had to fight a major fine as a result. And despite multiple apologies, Jackson's music videos were banned from several channels, and she was barred from appearing at the Grammys that year. To this day, one could argue that her career never really recovered. Timberlake, meanwhile, received little to no backlash at all. Not only did he attend that season's Grammys and win, he boasted after the incident, "...hey man, we love giving you all something to talk about." He even made light of the situation at the 2008 ESPY Awards. And although the FCC chairman has since apologized to Jackson for the hubbub, Timberlake would later say, "...I'm not touching that thing with a ten-foot pole." What a gentleman. Twitter Trouble in 2016, Timberlake learned a lesson that many other celebrities have awkwardly grasped since the beginning of the social media age. Think before you tweet. Timberlake tweeted that he had been inspired by the speech that actor Jesse Williams gave while accepting the Humanitarian Award at the BET Awards that July. But he was met with immediate disdain, chiefly by journalist Ernest Owens, who wrote, "...so does this mean you're gonna stop appropriating our music and culture?" and apologized to Janet, too. Timberlake responded by writing, "...oh, you sweet soul, the more you realize that we are the same, the more we can have a conversation. Bye." That, of course, only made things worse. So bad, in fact, that JT issued an apology mere hours later, saying, "...I feel misunderstood. I responded to a specific tweet that wasn't meant to be a general response. I shouldn't have responded anyway. I was truly inspired by Jesse Williams' speech because I really do feel that we are all one, a human race. I apologize to anyone that felt I was out of turn. I have nothing but love for you and all of us." But for some, it was too little, too timberlate. Title Troubles 
2016 wasn't exactly a great year overall for Timberlake. The singer was accused in three separate lawsuits of ripping off songs. The first incident came in January, when two members of the 70s group Sly, Slick and Wicked sued Timberlake's record label, alleging that the Timberlake Jay-Z hit Suit and Tie sampled its songs Show Nuff and entitled the band to royalties. The following month, Timberlake and Will I Am were sued by PK Music Performance, which alleged that the 2016 song Damn Girl was not the product of independent creation and actually copied portions of the 1969 song A New Day Is Here At Last. Then in April, Timberlake was sued by, believe it or not, Cirque du Soleil over the song Don't Hold the Wall, which the theater company claimed copied its song Steel Dream. Boy Band Backup Timberlake owes much of his career to the success of boy band In Sync, which dominated the pop music world in the late 90s and early 2000s. But in recent years, Timberlake has done a lot to distance himself from his original group. For one thing, he didn't invite the other four guys to his wedding to Jessica Biel. Then, despite inviting the guys to perform during his video Vanguard celebration at the 2013 MTV Music Video Awards, they wound up barely appearing on stage, which allegedly upset them. Then, in February 2017, Timberlake spoke to The Hollywood Reporter about why he left the boy band and claimed, We were on a stadium tour and I just felt like the whole thing was too big. It started as a fun snowball fight that was becoming an avalanche. And also, I was growing out of it. I felt like I cared more about the music than some of the other people in the group. I felt like I had other music I wanted to make and that I needed to follow my heart. Granted, being forced to wear matching leather outfits and sing songs called Digital Get Down sounds like a miserable experience, but come on, don't bite the hand that once fed you millions of dollars. Maroon 5 frontman and longtime coach on The Voice Adam Levine is an extremely talented guy. He's a musician, he can dance, he can do impressions, and he's managed to remain high on the A-list for well over a decade. But his time at the top hasn't been completely free of controversy. Here are some of the shadier moments in Levine's life so far. The Serial Modelizer Levine has developed something of a reputation for being attracted to a very specific type of woman, supermodels. Before he married Bahati Prinsloo, there was Nina Agdahl and Anne V, and those are just the ones we know about. And he has no shame in his runway-loving game. He explained to GQ, Men are not as sophisticated as women, they're not as mature as women, they're not as connected with their emotions as women. There's a very Neanderthal quality that still exists in a lot of men. There was a time in my life when I lived probably a bit more on the primal level, and it was amazing. Feuding with co-coaches Adam Levine is known for taking pot shots at Blake Shelton on The Voice, but that's probably just for show. Blake's sad because he didn't get someone. <laughs> <laughs> When it comes to everything else, though, his moments of on-screen sass seem to be a little too real. In 2012, for example, Levine started a beef with Christina Aguilera throwing contestant Tony Luca in the middle of things. Luca knew Aguilera from their Mickey Mouse Club days, so during his time on Team Adam, he was used to egg Aguilera on. The feud culminated with Luca's performance of Jay-Z's 99 Problems, which Aguilera deemed offensive. Your beautiful wife and your daughter and family are here tonight, and I just thought, you know, the lyrical connotation was a little derogatory towards women. When Adam then tried to deflect and say that the intention of the song was not to put women down, this led to an even bigger barb session between them. You know, we're not referring to women, we're referring to everything. If you're having girl problems. Yeah, so well, it it's, a, it's, a, it's called a metaphor. According to insiders, Levine picked the song for his contestant specifically because he knew it'd get under Aguilera's skin. One source told Radar Online, Adam and Tony Tony wanted to call Christina out as a but make it clear she's not a problem for Tony. It was completely aimed at her. And Levine's beef with Aguilera didn't end when cameras stopped rolling. One source claimed that he used the C-word against her behind the scenes, and as a result, she wanted him to be fired. Levine insisted to Rolling Stone, we just bicker like brother and sister. And part of it is fabricated by the television gods. But she's great. I respect the shit out of her. But it got to a point where the poor publicity warranted other coaches condemning the chaos. CeeLo Green spoke out to say, it's getting a little bit inconvenient for everyone. Adam hasn't come to me and spoken to me about his issues, and neither has Christina. But whatever it is, I'm hoping that we can get over it. Fortunately for voice fans, the two eventually squashed it. <laughs> but Christina Aguilera wasn't the only voice alum to catch his ire. He also reportedly took issue with current co-coach Miley Cyrus. A source claimed, Adam really cannot stand Miley because he thinks that she's the most obnoxious person ever. Playing Couch Critic 
Levine's feuds with female artists aren't limited to the ladies he works with on The Voice. The singer also seems to have a long-term bone to pick with Lady Gaga. In 2011, he tweeted, Lady Gaga took Vogue and Express Yourself and put them in a blender. The result? Born this way. Gaga never acknowledged this diss. Two years later, he took some more unprompted shots at Mother Monster via subtweets when she dropped her applause video from Art Pop, which referenced several major works of art throughout history. He wrote, Ugh, recycling old art for a younger generation doesn't make you an artist, it makes you an art teacher. I unabashedly love writing and performing pop music for both myself and everyone around me. That's it. It doesn't need any extra sauce. Gaga responded in kind, writing, Uh-oh, guys the art police is here. But Levine didn't back down and tweeted, By the way, I'm not an artist. I sing in a band and I make music with my friends. Methinks thou dost protest too much. Yikes. While we're at it, we should call the grammar police. The Perfume Stink Speaking of doth protest too much, Levine contradicted himself in a big way in 2012. In 2011, he tweeted, I also would like to put an official ban on celebrity fragrances, punishable by death from this point forward. The comment may or may not have been directed at voice frenemy Aguilera, who has several perfumes of her own, but she made sure to remind Levine of the comment a year later when he released a scent of his own. She tweeted, Ha ha! Adam Levine, what a difference a year makes. Welcome to the celebrity fragrance family. Even when he walked back on his original comments, however, he made sure to include a subtle jab at Christina's fragrances, telling people, I know there's a stigma attached to it, a stigma that I fully understand because I too hate the idea of a celebrity fragrance, absolutely 100%. I kind of thought to myself, well, I'm interested in fashion and there's a lot of things about it that could be really cool if done properly. So I wanted to do a thing that's never been done properly. Ouch. Calling himself out. If nothing else, at least Levine is somewhat self-aware. He told GQ he is well aware of how he can come off to others, saying, Would it be really easy to assume that I was a Definitely. 100%. But that doesn't mean that I am. Or maybe I am. I don't know. That's kind of how I feel. I'm not the easiest person to love right off the bat, you know. If I knew everyone in the world, they would love me. Every single last one of them. If you say so, Adam. Miranda Lambert is an icon of modern country music, but beneath all that charisma and talent, not to mention all those CMA awards, lies something a little darker than her charming smile lets on. Here's the shady side of Miranda Lambert. You know, it gets me in trouble sometimes, but I just feel like that's how God made me. In April 2018, Us Weekly reported that Lambert had ended her romance with country singer Anderson East, saying the split was amicable, but a source told In Touch that Lambert was, quote, devastated by the breakup and didn't see it coming. Still, just two weeks later, rumors surfaced that Lambert was allegedly dating Turnpike Troubadour's frontman Evan Felker, who just so happened to be a married man. Felker's band was opening for Lambert's Livin' Like Hippies tour, which began in January 2018. Us Weekly reported that Felker filed for divorce from his wife of two years just weeks after his tour with Lambert began. Lambert's split from Anderson East wasn't made public until months after her tour actually launched, and some sources allege that's not a coincidence. I don't know what you can do these days without get trying. At some angle, we'll try to tear you down. An insider told Us Weekly that Lambert and East were technically still a couple when she started hooking up with Felker, explaining that things had, quote, just happened between them on tour during songwriting sessions. In fact, when the couple first started spending time together, a witness who saw them brunching in public told Radar Online that they believed Lambert was actually out with East, not Felker, because she was being so obviously romantic. Even Felker's father-in-law at the time hinted that Lambert may have cheated on East. He told Radar Online, I don't like to spread rumors, but I'd say you're on the right track. Though country music star Blake Shelton never outright said that his marriage to Lambert ended due to infidelity, he hinted at it in his song, She's Got Away With Words. He also tweeted after Lambert's affair with Felker went public, Been taking the high road for a long time. I almost gave up. But I can finally see something on the horizon up there. Wait, could it be? Yup, it's karma. Sources told OK Magazine that Lambert had several, quote, dalliances during her marriage to Shelton, including an alleged fling with married baseball player Josh Beckett. 
but it was her rumored coziness with her married tour manager Ryan Westbrook that supposedly sent Shelton over the edge. Rumor has it her own bandmates were the ones who revealed the truth to Shelton, with the source telling the outlet. He'd taken Miranda back time and time again, and he would have done it again had she owned up to her mistakes and corrected them. It was a crushing blow to Blake's ego. Sources close to Lambert have consistently denied any rumored cheating, per Life & Style magazine. Of course, Shelton's own karma may have come into play when his marriage to Lambert came crashing down, because he reportedly met Lambert while he was married to his first wife in 2005. Shelton later admitted on Behind the Music, I was a married guy, you know, standing up there going, man, this shouldn't be happening. Looking back on that, I was falling in love with her right there on stage. Something just happened and, and I think we both knew it. Lambert also told Dateline that she knew Shelton was married and that pursuing a relationship with him was wrong, but she did it anyway. Lambert's own ex, Jeff Allen, called Shelton out for his apparent hypocrisy concerning the karma tweet. In a since-deleted tweet of his own, Allen wrote to Shelton, You know, I've always given you the benefit of the doubt and chalked it up to just being human, but you must be one arrogant SOB to pop off something like this, when I know damn good and well you were cheating on your wife and Miranda was cheating on me when you two started up. Sources close to Felker claim Lambert wooed him with her fame as the queen of country music. When you finally get to a place in your career where people are paying attention, you know, you have to decide what you want to use your platform for. An insider told People that before leaving for their tour together, Lambert and Felker began texting. Allegedly, the friendly and professional messages quickly grew increasingly flirtatious as the tour approached. A source claimed, he knew it was flirty and crossed a line with his wife. He showed her the whole thing and felt bad about it. He was like, I don't want to blow her off because this is the kind of money that can change our grandkids' lives if I'm able to write with this person. Sources claimed Lambert dropped hints at hooking up with Felker on social media, posting photos of his favorite beer before reports of their romance went public. But Felker wasn't the only man allegedly blinded by Lambert's success. A source told In Touch that it wasn't lost on East that he was launched into the quote, musical A-list once he and Lambert went public. Sources close to Lambert have insisted she did nothing inappropriate with Felker and was not responsible for his split from his wife, having apparently been under the impression that their marriage was already over before she set her sights on him. A source even told Hollywood Life that Lambert generally has a quote, all's fair in love and war type attitude, so she seized the opportunity to connect with Felker when it presented itself. I was hoping they would like play George Strait's song, we could like two-step to it. But others allege that Lambert had been deliberate in her pursuit of married men. A source told Us Weekly that this is a quote, pattern for her, while another insider claimed she has issues staying faithful to anyone with whom she's in a relationship, adding, Miranda is insecure and has too many yes people in her life. She does this to herself. The people around her don't feel bad anymore. Perhaps a large reason why Lambert's sketchy love life has gone relatively unnoticed is because of her breakup songs, which often paint her as being wronged, scorned, and heartbroken. are just so good that you can't imagine they'd be portraying a false narrative. When she won the 2018 CMA Award for Song of the Year for the heart-wrenching Tin Man, she thanked the audience for, quote, sharing her broken heart. Following her divorce from Shelton, she made cryptic social media posts about her alleged heartache, but didn't appear to actively court press nearly as much as Shelton. But Lambert did go on to lament to Cosmo, We were together for 10 years, married for four, were very quickly divorced, and are friends. I am still processing everything and figuring out where to go and what happened. A source told Life & Style, Blake was always made out to be the bad guy after he filed for divorce and sent Miranda packing from Oklahoma. Lambert played the victim. Whether it's good or bad, ugly, everything, you know, it's, it's, I just kind of spill my gut. While her personal life might seem like a bit of a mess, these days, Lambert is hugely successful and acclaimed in her career. But in her past, there have been rumors about conflict with fellow country star Casey Musgraves over Lambert's hit song, Mama's Broken Heart. Musgraves reportedly wrote the track and was reluctant to sell it to any other artist to record. In January 2013, Lambert, who grew up with Musgraves in Texas, told The Boot, 
We used to write together a lot and kind of went our separate ways. I don't think I was supposed to be pitched Mama's Broken Heart. But then, her sister actually shot some pictures at mine and Blake's wedding, and Casey was there too. At our rehearsal dinner, I went over and asked her, are you gonna cut this song or can I have it? And she was like, I'll think about it for a couple of days. Musgraves eventually gave in with the provision that she would sing harmony on the tune. However, according to the fader, based on some perceived shade Musgraves has thrown Lambert's way since, it seems like Musgraves may have been really reluctant to give up such a massive hit. In 2017, country music legend Garth Brooks lip-synced his performance at the CMAs. Brooks had previously performed 12 shows in 10 days before the awards show, telling press backstage that his voice, quote, wasn't there anymore at showtime, and that they did a game-day call on whether to cancel, sing, or lip-sync. But that wasn't good enough for Lambert's then-boyfriend, Anderson East, who wrote on Instagram, I keep a lot of opinions to myself and respect anyone making music, but as a person who tries to put on the best and most honest show I can night after night, this truly offends me. I was told country music is three chords and the truth. Lambert chimed in too, writing, High five on this, babe. If you can't sing, then don't. It's better to be honest than to pretend. But Lambert's comment must have felt like a slap in the face to Brooks, who had previously given her a sweet shout-out backstage, telling the press, Let me tell you who fought the good fight tonight, in my opinion. Miranda Lambert. She is one of the few females that we play, so you'd think she'd want to play it safe. She stuck country music in all of our faces tonight, traditional country music, so she's fighting the good fight. Lambert's breakout hit was the 2005 barn burner Kerosene, a breakup anthem that blasted up the charts. Though most of her lyrics were original, the music, down to a harmonica break and even some of the ad-libbed moments, were almost identical to Steve Earle's 1996 track, I Feel Alright. When it was brought to Lambert's attention, by the press and the public, but not by Earle himself, she was quick to add a credit for Earle as a co-writer on the song, which entitled him to half the hit's royalties. He later told Rolling Stone, I hadn't even heard it, and I felt bad telling her that I never would have done anything about it either if I'd known, because I don't do like that. I've been sued enough, mainly divorces, so I don't particularly care to be involved in that myself. Lambert and Earl, who she has called one of her heroes, eventually collaborated on the duet, This Is How It Ends. Hey, we wrote it as a duet, and it's pretty strong. Lambert and Evan Felker split in August 2018, and Felker had finalized his divorce from his ex-wife that same month. But after the breakup, Felker wasn't just out of a wife and a girlfriend, he was also out of a touring gig. His career with the Turnpike Troubadours has suffered since then, with the band announcing an indefinite hiatus in October 2018, according to Rolling Stone. For her part, Lambert appeared largely unbothered with the split, telling the Tennessean that she was, quote, happily single. Sort of good for now. She told the outlet, Love is a hard road sometimes, and it's been a roller coaster ride for me, but I'm definitely thankful for all the ups and downs because I've had some really good songs come out of it. You've got to take the bad parts and put them on paper, and then move on to the happy parts. Lambert rebounded relatively quickly from Felker with NYPD officer Brendan McLaughlin. According to People magazine, the couple reportedly met in November 2018 during Lambert's appearance on Good Morning America in Times Square, where McLaughlin often worked. They supposedly began dating almost immediately and secretly tied the knot in January 2019, with a source claiming to Us Weekly that Lambert didn't give her ex, Lake Shelton, a heads up either. Lambert announced the wedding news that February. How did you keep it a secret from everybody? I just am good like that. But Lambert might want to have considered McLaughlin's allegedly shady past. Us Weekly reports that McLaughlin was once engaged to a woman named Jackie Bruno, who went overseas to play soccer. When Bruno returned, she reportedly learned that McLaughlin had cheated and gotten another woman pregnant. According to Radar Online, that other woman and McLaughlin welcomed their first child just days after he met Lambert. Meanwhile, Lambert is enjoying her new role as stepmom, and has a pretty interesting perspective on the whole situation. In June 2019, she gushed to extra of her time with her husband's son. I'm loving that whole phase, and I've raised a million dogs, so I feel like I've got that part of my womanly, motherly thing full. So this is a whole new journey. It's great. Anyone that can accept eight dogs, four cats, five horses, too many horses is a good guy. <laughs> he loves all of us as a unit.
Carrie Underwood is one of the most beloved country stars in the game and has mostly managed to stay away from controversy. But it turns out even she isn't immune to the occasional shady moment. Here are some sketchy things you may not know about Carrie Underwood. Underwood and Brad Paisley teamed up to co-host the CMA Awards year after year from 2008 until 2018. And there were times their quips ruffled feathers. In 2017, the duo took aim at the then-president when they mocked Donald Trump's infamous Twitter behavior with a parody of Underwood's hit, Before He Cheats. Transforming it into Before He Tweets, the song was about Trump's often bizarre social media ramblings. It's safe to say social media had a lot to say about the bit. I will never, ever regret that. In 2012, Underwood and Paisley fired off a joke that didn't exactly land for Taylor Swift. Paisley said, The greatest trade of the year had to be the Kennedy family, who somehow traded Arnold Schwarzenegger for Taylor Swift. After Underwood informed her co-host that Swift was no longer dating Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s son, the duo kicked off a We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together reference. When Swift was asked about the joke and why the camera didn't cut to her in the audience, she told the New York Times Magazine, they don't pan to you if you're not laughing. Yikes. Underwood had some choice words about former boyfriend Tony Romo following their split in 2007. The star opened up about the athlete in an interview with Allure, where she said the former professional football player, who was her date to the 2007 ACM Awards, supposedly still tried to call her following their breakup. She revealed, The phone will ring and it'll be him, and I'll maybe not answer. We were both small town people doing very big things, and we relied on each other dealing with fame. Underwood's remarks raised some eyebrows, since Romo was dating Jessica Simpson at the time. Simpson hit back at Underwood's claims during an interview with The Woody and Jim Show shortly after. She said, Tony and I both laughed at that. Yeah, we got a chuckle out of it. Simpson went on to say that Romo definitely didn't still call Underwood. She she added, If Tony wanted to call her or be with her, he would. But that wasn't the only shady remark Underwood made about Romo. She also insinuated that the football star wasn't the best boyfriend when asked if her 2009 single Cowboy Casanova was about him. But if anyone assumed the title was a reference to the team Romo played on for 14 seasons, Underwood insisted, That's not the case. She told Esquire in 2009, I would never immortalize a guy that did me wrong. I would never give him that much credit. Underwood may have hit former Gossip Girl actor Leighton Meester with some tough love in 2010, if reports are to be believed, that is. According to Us Weekly, when the two crossed paths at the CMA Awards, they supposedly didn't have the friendliest exchange. In 2010, Meester was a presenter at the awards show, and Underwood co-hosted with Brad Paisley. Meester was said to have been on edge at the event, since she was trying to carve out a country music career for herself at the time and had just starred in the movie Country Strong. Just before hitting the stage, a source claimed Underwood supposedly told Meester, get out there and don't f up. Apparently, this made Leighton even more nervous than she already was. The insider added, Later, someone said to Carrie, that was mean. And Carrie said, she'll get over it. Someone said that to me once, and I got over it. If the rumor mill is to be believed, Underwood may not see eye to eye with Leanne Rimes, and it may or may not have something to do with Rimes' reaction to Underwood taking home Best Female Vocalist at the CMAs in 2006. In a since-deleted essay that went up on her website, Rimes wrote, We all work very hard and have for many years, so to see someone come in and win female vocalist that has been here for a very short time is a little disheartening. I might pick a song by Carrie Underwood. <laughs> In 2014, Starr claimed tensions supposedly boiled over between the two when they both attended the taping of CMA Country Christmas in November. According to a source, Underwood found out that her dressing room was near Rhymes's and supposedly asked the organizers to get her room switched. As for why, a source claimed, Carrie can't stand Leanne. She thinks Leanne is desperate, unoriginal, and a has-been. Despite the rumors, the two have been spotted together on at least two occasions where they looked pretty happy to be in each other's company. So what's really going on between these two is anyone's guess. Is there drama between Underwood and Taylor Swift? The two made headlines for an alleged feud in 2013 when Us Weekly claimed that they weren't on good terms. So much so that they supposedly asked to be seated away from each other at the Grammy Awards that year. A source claimed they hate each other and said, Taylor feels Carrie is always rude to her, so she steers clear of her. 
However, it's worth noting a rep for the Grammys told the outlet that no requests were received from either artist. In a 2013 interview with Allure, Underwood suggested she and Swift didn't really have a relationship whatsoever. She said, I'm not close to her. We run into each other at events. We're never in the same place at the same time. She also downplayed the reports of drama in a CBS This Morning interview with Gail King that same year. When asked if there was a feud, she said, No, not that I know of at least. In every magazine, in pretty much every newspaper or on gossip TV shows, they can just get away with it by saying a source said or an insider said. I've read the most ridiculous things about myself when people do that. I feel like women are the backbone of country music. As far as country music legends go, Blake Shelton has earned himself a spot among the greats. Still, you don't make it as far as he has without stepping on some boots. From missteps to marital issues, this is the shady side of Blake Shelton. Things were different for Shelton when he arrived in Nashville, and not just because he was rocking a mullet. As Country Fancast noted, he was romantically attached to his high school sweetheart, who was his tour manager at the beginning of his career when he found success with his first big hit, Austin, in 2001. The two got hitched in 2003, with Shelton recounting his proposal to CMT that year, saying, I got in from hunting that morning and asked her to marry me, and we went back out hunting. It was a backwoods dream come true, until they divorced in 2006. The split was hard on Shelton, who told 60 Minutes that it was, quote, the toughest thing that I'd ever been through. Still, it seems the decision was easier than he let on, as he had already met the woman who would become his next wife, Miranda Lambert. When the two performed You're the Reason God Made Oklahoma for CMT's 100 Greatest Duets in 2005, their chemistry was palpable. In 2011, Shelton told Behind the Music, I was a married guy, you know. Looking back on that, I was falling in love with her. Confirmation of their relationship wouldn't come until 2007, but you can read into his ex-wife's divorce filing, which cited inappropriate marital conduct however you'd like. Oh, and Shelton ditched his mullet around the same time. Shelton and Miranda Lambert's entire relationship was in the limelight, and they were candid about the pressures of tabloid scrutiny. Shelton revealed to 60 Minutes that they stopped doing interviews together as their marriage was, quote, all we got left that's private. And Lambert poked fun at being, quote, married to a man who's married to attention on 2014's Priscilla. When they did speak about their relationship, however, it was a double-edged sword. We're not country music stars at home, we're just very normal country people. While their 2008 tour was a success, Lambert admitted to Redbook that she was, quote, glad we decided to keep both of our buses, since Shelton got on her nerves. For his part, Shelton told CMT News the same year, as miserable as we are together, it's way more miserable when we're apart. We sing to each other all the time, and it normally doesn't go that well because uh, for the most part, I can't stand the music that she listens to. After their 2011 marriage, Shelton's trickster attitude was a continued point of contention, and he admitted to People Magazine in 2013, I'm always pestering her. Anything I can think of to get a rise out of her is a sport for me. As infidelity rumors swirled around two years into their marriage, Shelton divulged to the publication that they totally trusted each other, and had a policy about going through each other's phones. He said, I'll say, go dig through my drawers or my computer if you feel like you need to. They continued to tease tabloids and tweets, but their 2015 divorce announcement to Us Weekly revealed no one quite got the last laugh. Shelton and Lambert announced their divorce in July 2015, stating that, quote, this was not the future we envisioned, but things only got shadier after their split went public. Days after their announcement, amid rumors that Lambert had cheated on Shelton with another country star, Chris Young took to Twitter to clarify that he was, quote, not a contributing factor in their divorce. In fact, weeks later, TMZ alleged that it was a classic case of he said, she said, and Shelton was the one who cheated on Lambert with a famous country singer. To make matters worse, the outlet also reported that Shelton had demanded Lambert to move her pets out from their shared ranch the same day that their divorce became official. 
Despite the conflicting reports, Shelton seemingly pointed the finger at Lambert again with the release of his next album, If I'm Honest, in 2016. He didn't write the record's third single, She's Got Away With The Words, which recounts a woman who lies, cheats, and quote, puts a big F you in his future. But Billboard wrote, If you want to assume it describes some of the facts of his divorce, Shelton won't stop you. While Shelton and Lambert only officially called it quits in July 2015, TMZ reported that Shelton was already dating fellow The Voice judge Gwen Stefani by November. Within weeks, the new couple was flaunting their relationship all over social media, from Stefani sharing a video of the two kissing for the holidays, to Shelton flirting on Twitter about her quote, guaranteed greatness in the recording studio. Though Shelton seemingly went to great lengths to keep his relationship with Lambert private, it appears to not be as big of an issue with Stefani. The two have already released a handful of duets together, including Go Ahead and Break My Heart on Shelton's post-divorce LP If I'm Honest, and You Make It Feel Like Christmas from Stefani's 2017 Christmas album of the same name. That said, Shelton is quick to dismiss any notion of infidelity with his The Voice co-star, telling Billboard in 2016 that before his divorce, he quote, never really got to know Stefani despite working together. After revealing his split to the cast and crew, he said Stefani confided in him that she was going through a similar situation with Gavin Rossdale, her then-husband of 20 years. They exchanged numbers to continue supporting each other and grew closer, with Shelton telling the outlet, Gwen saved my life. Who else on earth could understand going through a high-profile divorce from another musician? Gwen Stefani was everybody's dream girl, you know? And so it's like that was I was walking on sacred ground. Following his 2015 divorce from Lambert, Shelton released his 10th album in 2016, If I'm Honest, and had no scruples in telling Billboard that it was his divorce record. The title of the album alone implied that Shelton had a fair amount to say about the split, and he said the collection, which was mostly recorded six months after things went sour, provides, quote, a general idea about what happened. He explained, When you have a broken heart, at least when I do, you got to get it out of your system. You want people to sympathize with you. I was at rock bottom in the middle of hell. Shelton told the outlet about the inspiration behind the album, saying, The album represents a very specific time frame, from when it became painfully obvious that it wasn't going to work out, to falling for Gwen Stefani. It's my happy falling in love record, too. At the time, the album's brutal honesty scored him the second biggest selling debut of his career. In 2018, his second ex-wife struck back in her own way, releasing her divorce anthem, Got My Name Changed Back, as the lead single from her side project, Pistol Annie's album, Interstate Gospel. The playful video finds her hitting the DMV to ditch her ex's last name, and Lambert called the track a celebration of reclaiming yourself in an interview on the group's YouTube channel. Shelton is the first person to joke around and not take himself too seriously. He told TMZ in 2012, How can you stand to be in this business and not drink your face off? However, don't go too far with the jabs. In 2015, TMZ reported Shelton's attorney struck back at In Touch Weekly, demanding it rescind a story that alleged Shelton had cheated on Lambert with country singer Katie Groves. But that was just the start of his legal battles with the press. Later that year, TMZ also reported that Shelton was suing In Touch Weekly and its parent company for defamation after it ran a cover story reporting that he was headed to rehab, that his alcohol addiction had ruined his marriage with Lambert, and that his gig on The Voice was on the line. By 2017, USA Today reported that Shelton and the publication's lawyers had reached a settlement and asked the judge to toss out the case. While details are unknown, both sides reportedly paid their own litigation costs. Despite the hurt feelings, the singer continues to boast about booze, but on his own terms. Like when he took swigs from a cup that read, I drink, get over it, at a Fort Lauderdale concert in 2016. Or when he shamelessly champions his love for liquor with songs like 2019's Tequila Sheila. I'm happy to have you here. We're going to do the... Oh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Shelton has become one of Twitter's favorite loudmouths since joining in 2008, amassing over 20 million followers. 
He attributed his unfiltered tweets to the reason why NBC recruited him for The Voice, telling Billboard in 2016, "...they probably thought, we need somebody that'll shake things up. In country music, everybody else falls in line." Fellow country singer Trace Adkins agreed, telling the outlet, "...he says whatever he wants to say, and it has turned into a goldmine." But speaking your mind has consequences, even if you're an eight-time Grammy nominee. In 2016, Shelton apologized for resurfaced misogynistic and homophobic tweets, writing, "...everyone knows comedy has been a major part of my career, and it's always been out there for anyone to see." That said, anyone that knows me also knows I have no tolerance for hate of any kind or form. Can my humor at times be inappropriate and immature? Yes. Hateful? Never. That said, I deeply apologize to anybody who may have been offended. Still, the country singer loves a good troll. When a fan tweeted she didn't like Shelton's new music, he fired back, writing, "...someone who doesn't know me at all can't stand me. How will I live?" To any haters out there, have yourself a nice warm cup full of camel balls. In 2020, the power of Taylor Swift's fanbase forced him to delete a tweet and apologize, when he told a Swifty to quote, "...get out of your mom's basement for a while." After the fan, who didn't tag Shelton, said they'd burn down his house if he blocked Swift's number one debut. Shelton may have seen a neon light at the end of a tunnel in his 2014 Gold Certified track, but the city of Nashville wanted him to turn it the heck down. In 2019, the Nashville location of Shelton's restaurant chain Old Red, named after his hit tune, lost a lawsuit against the city's Metro Historic Zoning Commission, according to News Channel 5 Nashville. The bar was banned from using its signature red exterior lights, as city regulations reportedly banned the use of colored lights outside of buildings and historic overlay districts to protect the character of historical areas, a category Shelton's Honky Tonk falls into thanks to its spot on Broadway. The Ryman Hospitality Group, which co-owns Shelton's Old Red, doubled down on its original design, saying in a statement that they are, quote, "...exploring and intend to pursue additional avenues that would allow them to continue lighting the building the same way." Considering Shelton and his partners opened a new location in Orlando the next year, it seems they're not afraid of causing a little heat in the name of a good time. Shelton has been a country music mainstay for decades, and he's seen fads come and go. But bro country, a subgenre vulture coined in 2013 as music by and of the tatted, gym-toned, party-heart young American white dude, forced Shelton to get a little hypocritical. After a 2014 Washington Times article lumped Shelton in the category with Luke Bryan and Florida Georgia Line, the singer took to Twitter to slightly defend himself, writing, Ha! I just read an article that includes me in the bro country genre. He brushed it off by listing the other subgenres he's been named in, including pop country, traditional, and hip hop. In 2016, he seemed to further separate himself from his peers at the opening of his Country Music Hall of Fame exhibit, saying, "...in 2001, you didn't show up wearing a t-shirt and a baseball cap to be on stage, and that's just still my mentality. Clearly, I'm one of the last ones standing." A look at Shelton's discography shows that perhaps the line between him and his bro country peers isn't so clear. While Shelton admitted to Billboard in 2016 that his 2013 mega-hit Boys Round Here was quote, a stupid song, even his newer fare, like 2019's Hell Right, has been written off by critics as bro country. Christina Aguilera has a beautiful voice, but a bad reputation. After multiple feuds with the likes of Lady Gaga, Kelly Osbourne, and The Wanted, not everyone has forgiven Aguilera for her attitude. <laughs> Interesting. Sour Grapes Aguilera spent five years on The Voice, but she completely slammed the competition series in a May 2018 interview with Billboard, calling the show an energy sucker. She added, "...I didn't get into this business to be a television show host and to be given all these rules, especially as a female. I would find myself on that show desperately trying to express myself through clothing or makeup or hair. It was my only kind of outlet." Of course, it may be her salary that made her so bitter. When Aguilera was the only female vocalist judging the show, she took home $17 million per season, but she took pay cuts in her later seasons, earning $12.5 million. Constant Beef 
Perhaps part of why Aguilera got a pay cut at The Voice was because, allegedly, she was so aggravating to everyone else on set that she wasn't worth her hefty paychecks. A source told Radar Online in 2015, Christina is such a terror to work with. She is frequently late, and she doesn't even seem to care or apologize for holding up the filming of the show. Insiders also told Star that Aguilera's tardiness often held up production, and that her diva demands included having a staffer whose sole job was to massage her feet every 30 minutes. The Radar Online source added, to make matters worse, she is constantly fighting with Adam Levine. They cannot stand each other. Bossy boss. Working with Aguilera is difficult enough, but sources say working for Aguilera is even worse. Insiders told OK Magazine that her constant diva demands have led most of Aguilera's personal staff to throw in the towel and seek employment elsewhere. A source revealed, She has no problem waking up a nanny or maid for the most menial tasks. She's even called a staffer from the other end of the house to get something like a towel that was mere feet away from her. Of course, that's hearsay from anonymous sources, but if even part of it is true, it's definitely not a good look. Outing an ex Aguilera dated backup dancer Jorge Santos for two years leading up to the release of her sophomore album, Stripped. In 2002, she told MTV News that her songs Infatuation and Underappreciated were inspired by her relationship with Santos. Fast forward to March 2018, and it gets a little complicated. Aguilera was a guest on RuPaul's Drag Race, Untucked, and one of the drag queens asked Aguilera if Infatuation was inspired by someone. She revealed, It was heartbreaking because I found out he played for your team, not mine. <laughs> She didn't mention Santos by name, but fans easily pieced that together. Oh, he gonna see this! He gonna be mad! I hate What a girl wants. In Aguilera's case, what a girl wants seems to be booze. In 2011, she and partner Matthew Rutler were both taken into custody after a boozy night out at a Los Angeles eatery. People reported Rutler was booked for a DUI after his erratic driving and Aguilera was taken in for public intoxication but wasn't charged. Three days later, Us Weekly reported that Aguilera and Rutler were at the same restaurant again going through wine like it was water, though this time they hired a chauffeured limo. A source close to the singer revealed she should see the arrest as a wake-up call, but she doesn't. She doesn't think things are that bad. Despite their busts for alcohol-related issues, Aguilera and Rutler still love to party. Page Six reported in December 2015 that Aguilera was, quote, a mess at Seth MacFarlane's Christmas party. The source claimed, Seth asked her five times to come up and sing, and she refused. The reason she didn't get up is because she was wasted. Throwing Punches you may remember Christina Aguilera feuding with fellow singer Pink, beginning back when they were part of the 2002 Lady Marmalade cover with Maya and Lil' Kim. But that wasn't the end of it. After the pair made amends, Pink recalled on an October 2017 episode of Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen that their feud once became physical. Actually, she swung on me in, really? in a club. In a club? Hilarious. Mean Girl in the 2004 film Mean Girls, Daniel Francesi's character sings Aguilera's Beautiful in their school's winter talent show. As a result of the career-making role, Francesi was beyond thrilled when he finally got the chance to meet the actual beautiful belter, but it didn't go well at all. He told Yahoo Entertainment, I met Christina Aguilera and I thought for sure that would be an exciting moment in my life. And I was like, Christina, my name's Daniel. I sing Beautiful in Mean Girls. And she was like, never saw it, and then turned her back and walked away. She was so rude. At this point, should we be surprised? Travis Scott is someone who can be called an A-list rapper. He's known for his records, his concerts, and his relationship with Kylie Jenner. But he's also known for a number of pretty questionable choices. Here's what we unearthed on the shady side of Travis Scott. Travis Scott and Kylie Jenner began dating publicly in 2017 during Coachella, but two years later, they put their relationship on hold. The break came after it was rumored that Scott cheated on Jenner with model Rogine Carr. He denied this on Instagram. Scott posted, It's really affecting when you see false things said about you. Once again, these false stories about me cheating are just simply not true. Focusing on life, music, and family at this moment is what's real. Carr also responded to the cheating rumor on Instagram, writing, None of these rumors are true. It's just the internet creating a false narrative. Please stop spreading lies and leave us alone because it's affecting real lives. Thank you. That wasn't the only time talk of cheating put a dent in Scott and Jenner's relationship. 
In early 2019, the rapper postponed a show during his Astro World Wish You Were Here tour. He flew back west to deal with allegations that he was unfaithful to Jenner. The couple eventually got back together. With an Instagram post in September 2021, Kylie Jenner announced that she and Scott were having their second child. The first celeb ever to have his own McDonald's meal was Michael Jordan in 1992. Decades later, Travis Scott became the first musician to score a deal with the fast food chain. In September of 2020, the rapper drove to a McDonald's in Downey, California in his red Lamborghini to promote his meal. A massive crowd formed. Scott then got on top of a car, danced, and signed autographs. Afterwards, he was fined $200 for failing to secure a film permit and for not being authorized to hold an event with over 200 people. Then, in February 2021, the rapper was investigated by Los Angeles City officials after he gathered another huge crowd in West Hollywood to promote his issue of ID magazine. If there's anyone who knows how to ignore a city protocol, it's Mr. Scott. Travis Scott doesn't have a reputation for being a fighter or even a hothead, but he got into arguments with two of his fellow rappers, Meek Mill and Tory Lanez. In the situation with Mill, Scott argued with him at a fancy-schmancy party in the Hamptons in July 2021. However, it's unclear what the two rappers were beefing over. The dispute with Lanes was revealed in March 2018 after a video leaked. The argument was allegedly about Lanes responding to an accusation that he hijacked Travis Scott's flow while featured on Mill's song Liddy. Allegedly, Scott approached Lanes over a tweet that Lanes had posted which said, I can't sound like somebody I wrote for. And that's when things went awry. But thankfully, cooler heads won that day and no punches were thrown. In 2016, former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick began kneeling for the national anthem before games to protest racial injustice and police brutality in the United States. Fast forward to 2019, when Travis Scott was tapped to play at the Super Bowl with Maroon 5 and Outkast Big Boy. Nick Cannon blasted Scott for accepting while explaining why it was okay for Big Boy to perform. Cannon implied that Scott didn't care about social justice. This was also said of Scott after he spoke about Mike Brown's death on Hot 97 in 2014. Scott said, And I'm not saying he deserved to get killed. He didn't. But I'm not, just, I'm not saying that he didn't deserve to like pay for consequences that he probably inflicted. In 2020, after George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer, Scott did an about-face on social justice while talking on his Dot Wave radio show. Scott admitted, I was young and might have just been misinformed. Florida rapper Denzel Curry was harassed by Travis Scott's fans in 2020, but was not afraid to address the backlash on social media. It all had to do with an opinion that he gave during a Twitter Q&A when someone asked if he'd ever work with the Houston rapper, in which Curry tweeted, "...his attitude is funky." Afterward, the rapping Floridian sent a message saying how Scott's fans were angry with him for, quote, "...keeping it real about the rapper." He also wrote that he has Scott, quote, "...stands and people with, quote, "...no hairline sending him mean messages for calling Scott's attitude funky. Travis Scott's song Highest in the Room has nearly half a million views on YouTube. The 2019 single also went number one on Billboard. But a Danish producer named Benjamin Lasnier said neither of those things would be possible without the head-nodding guitar riff that floats through the song, which he claimed Travis Scott stole. Lasnier claimed he uploaded the riff to his Instagram page and later sent it to Jamie Jimmy Cash Lepper, a person who works with Scott. Lasnier then supposedly heard a variation of the riff on Travis Scott's highest in the room. The producer then sued Scott for his cut of the profits, saying that the track has pulled in more than $20 million. Scott was also sued by 3-6 Mafia's DJ Paul for allegedly stealing the hook to their 1997 song, Tear to Club Up. DJ Paul claims the hook was used on Scott's No Bystanders record, released in 2018. It's not clear how much Paul received, but Rolling Stone reported in 2019 that both rappers settled the suit. Paul is now credited as a writer on No Bystanders, as are the other 3-6 Mafia members, so everything turned out well for everyone. In 2015, Travis Scott ramped up his audience to a fever pitch when he played at Chicago's Lollapalooza and invited the crowd to leap over the barricades. He yelled at security as fans made their way to the stage, "'Everybody in the green shirt, get the f back!' Thank you for everything. Everything. He saved my life." As security continued to get overwhelmed, a mini-riot broke out, mostly on stage, and Chicago police got involved. After fleeing the scene, Travis Scott was arrested and charged with disorderly conduct. 
A fan from the riot faced the same charge. Scott was released on bail, but did the rapper learn his lesson about starting riots? The answer would have to be a no. According to TMZ in 2017, after performing in Rogers, Arkansas, Scott was booked for inciting a riot, endangering welfare of a minor, and disorderly conduct. Travis Scott was $150,000 richer after being paid to perform at a pre-Super Bowl concert in 2018 at Myth Nightclub in Minneapolis. The company said that Scott never showed up and canceled his performance just hours before hitting the stage. The promoters had to say goodbye to the advance and the dough they spent on promoting the show, plus securing a private jet for the rapper. Scott was supposed to be paid $200,000 total, so he had already pocketed most of the money before rapping a word. Event company P Jam sued Scott, but he countersued, claiming that the company didn't provide him with agreed-upon travel arrangements. Scott was ultimately ordered to pay over $382,000 in spring 2019. Scott's attorney, Howard King, told TMZ, "...the verdict was disappointing but far less than the seven-figure demands made by the promoters." The rapper blamed the weather and scheduling issues for ghosting the gig, but he did show up to other scheduled shows that same night, like one in Las Vegas, which certainly didn't help his case. They may be from two different generations and musical genres, but that didn't keep Travis Scott and Motley Crue's Tommy Lee from getting into a beef over a roller coaster of all things. In 2018, during Scott's The Astro World Wish You Were Here tour, he rapped on stage while going upside down on an actual roller coaster. Tommy Lee did something similar on a Motley Crue tour in 2011 by playing the drums upside down on a coaster built for the stage. Lee wrote on Instagram, just found out this f***ing idiot Travis Scott or someone on his team ripped off the 360 and the Crucifly, WTF. In a separate post with another coaster comparison, Lee added, "...get an original idea, bro. I get copying is a form of flattery, but this is just straight ripping off my sh Scott's attorney quickly shut down Lee's, quote, "...outburst and said he didn't come up with the roller coaster idea." The veteran drummer then shot back and claimed that Scott hired the same company, SGPS, to design the set, which, in his mind, proved Scott stole the idea. Lee dropped his beef with Scott, but it's safe to assume he won't be playing drums on the rapper's future songs. In a 2021 interview with Lofus Yell, Travis Scott admitted that he owns so many vehicles, he can't even name them all. During that discussion, the rapper spoke at length about his love for purchasing cars and how he also loves to custom design them. But just because Scott is passionate about cars doesn't mean he's an expert driver. That was evident in 2016 when he was seen backing his Lamborghini into another vehicle while leaving a parking spot. The Texas native was at Glendale Galleria in Southern California at the time. Fortunately, for all parties involved, there wasn't any harm done to either car. Maybe Scott should do the whole cliché rich person thing and hire a chauffeur. Ja Rule is one of the music industry's greatest enigmas. Despite selling millions of records, his career has been anything but smooth sailing, with the rapper often finding himself caught up in a whirlwind of bad press. This is the shady side of Ja Rule. Selling drugs is sometimes considered a means of success and survival for many, and celebrating that lifestyle is deeply ingrained in hip-hop culture. Growing up in Hollis, Queens, Ja Rule began to emulate the local drug dealers at a young age. Speaking in a 2014 Vlad TV interview, the rapper said, "...that's your first sight of what success is, and you figure out how to obtain that success, and the easiest way is to grab a pack and go out on the block or whatever." He revealed that he first got into drug dealing around the age of 12 or 13, explaining that he was inevitably forced into hustling to help him and his mother stay afloat. The occupation led to some awkward relationships for a young Ja Rule as he remembers selling to the parents of his friends, saying, "...you know, our motto was, if they ain't gonna get it from us, they would get it from somebody else. So when I look back on those times and situations, I was like, that was like some crazy to do. Sell to your man's moms." Ja! What is this new look? I don't know, man. She, she want me to leave this street life alone. I guess that's what I'm gonna do. Before they were trading lyrical shots on the industry's biggest stages, Ja Rule and 50 Cent were just two rappers coming up from nearby neighborhoods in Queens, New York. According to 50, their longtime feud initially started when Ja saw him with the guy who stole his chain. However, Ja Rule denied this claim, suggesting instead that the beef began when 50 Cent supposedly felt slighted after being left out of the Murder for Life video shoot in 1999. 50 alleged to XXL that he did stop by that video shoot to confront Ja, but was pulled aside by legendary 
legendary gangster and drug kingpin Kenneth Supreme McGriff, who apparently told him, "'Leave them alone, man. You know they ain't gonna do nothing.'" But the young rapper didn't listen. Black Child, one of Ja Rule's collaborators, remembers their nemesis showing up that day, telling Vlad TV, "'I guess he feel like Ja ain't roll out the red carpet for him. He went back to the hood and wrote a song.'" That song was Your Life's on the Line, in which 50 Cent appears to mock Ja Rule's murder chant. In another song created during that time, Ghetto Quran, 50 revealed some information about Supreme's past illegal activity. The following year, the rapper was shot nine times and Supreme was investigated for allegedly plotting his death. While the two feuds may appear unconnected, Ja Rule later claimed to Hot 97 that 50 Cent told investigators that there was a link. A couple of months before the infamous 2000 shooting, both Ja Rule and 50 Cent were set to perform in Atlanta. All parties involved remember a conversation taking place between the two rappers that turned into a fight after mutual friend Chaz Slim Williams convinced them to talk. But the other details differ. Williams claims Ja came to speak to 50 with a baseball bat in his hand. After he gestured with the bat, 50 Cent reportedly took a swing at him and a scuffle broke out. While Williams alleged that no one was hurt in the fight, Ja Rule had a different story. He told Hot 97, "...the talk got heated because I got mad and I started screaming at him and telling him that he was a so he swings at me. He caught me a little bit, but I dipped it and then hit him with the bat. Boom. So now we start tussling." However, Black Child remembers it even more theatrically, telling Vlad TV, "...me and Ja chased him through the lobby, and the elevator doors closed just in time." According to XXL, 50 Cent claimed that Ja Rule lost a necklace pendant during the fight, which was snatched up by one of 50's guys and swapped for a Movado watch. However, Ja Rule denied this particular allegation. Shortly after the 2000 incident in Atlanta, Ja Rule and 50 Cent came together once again, this time in New York City at the Hit Factory recording studio. As producer Chris Gotti later told Vlad TV, Ja, despite being on crutches at the time, reportedly found out 50 was in the building and was determined to confront him, recalling, "...we have about 40, 50 guys with us. We went looking for him in the studio." The result, per the New York Times, was 50 Cent suffering multiple cuts and stab wounds on his back. Gotti and his brother Irv Gotti, the CEOs of Ja Rule's Murder, Inc. record label, were each charged with gang assault and first-degree assault. Meanwhile, rapper Black Child confessed to stabbing 50 in the back but claimed it was in self-defense. Per Complex, the charges were later dismissed. For his part, 50 Cent claimed that he didn't even go to the hospital afterward, though the New York Times reported that 50 obtained an order of protection against his assailants afterward, which put a dent in his street credibility. While Ja Rule wasn't technically present for the incident, it definitely didn't help his ongoing going feud, with the rappers each releasing diss tracks, including Jaws' Race Against Time 2 and 50 Cent's Back Down. In June 2004, Ja Rule was at a nightclub in Toronto when a group of patrons formed near him and began shouting derogatory statements about his already infamous feud with 50 Cent, per USA Today. Becoming frustrated with the crowd, Ja allegedly punched a man in his face with the victim receiving a black eye and cuts. He was charged and subsequently released on $10,000 bail. Early the following year, Ja Rule pleaded guilty to assault and received a $1,200 fine. He commented to reporters after his court appearance, "...I'm just sorry about my actions. I know I haven't made you proud. How could I with all this mess I got going on? The judge also apologized on behalf of Toronto that day, condemning some of the comments that were allegedly said. However, the incident didn't end there for Ja Rule. The man who was punched filed a civil suit against him. A December 2004 party held for Ja Rule at a club in Midtown, New York, turned bloody when a man was shot and killed and another wounded in the after hours. According to the New York Post, investigators were initially pointed in the direction of the rapper and his bodyguards after they spoke to the surviving victim. While the possible motive seemed a little unclear, it was suggested that the shooting may have been related to another crime. Both victims previously served time behind bars and were the rumored suspects of a string of robberies, including one on rapper Foxy Brown's brother. Investigators may have believed that Ja Rule's bodyguards were acting in revenge for the robberies, or in anger for bringing that kind of heat to the rapper's party. Regardless of the reason, investigators allegedly possessed surveillance footage, which showed Ja Rule's vehicle stop outside the club after Moore and Clark walked past it. One of the rapper's bodyguards was seen approaching the car and reportedly said, "'Come with me. It's coming down.'" Then another bodyguard exited the vehicle, and the two men from Ja Rule's security team apparently shot Moore and Clark. 
In her 2005 book, Confessions of a Video Vixen, Corinne Steffens dropped quite a few scandalous bombshells on the music industry. The former video dancer revealed that she had affairs with a slew of big-name celebrities, many of them in relationships with other women at the time. She was even married to hip-hop pioneer Cool G Rap, but it was her alleged time with Ja Rule that impacted her most, telling The New York Times. After the thing was over with Ja, I think I went a little crazy searching for his replacement. Once something was over with one of them, even if it ended horribly, that would only make me want to regain what I thought I had." But Ja Rule, who had been in a relationship with the same woman since high school, denied Stefan's allegations. During a 2013 Hip Hollywood interview, the rapper guessed at Stefan's motives, claiming, "...I'm a target for fallacious women that want to not see me and my wife happy, so they'll make up stories and do whatever they have to do to sell books or be on TV shows." Stefan's took some flack by members of the industry for the book being a blatant fame grab, but over the years has commented that the criticism comes with a double standard. But here's the thing. When men do it, it's expected. When a woman does it, it's a problem. In the early 2000s, Lil Mo and Ja Rule collaborated to make two massive hits, I Cry and Put It On Me. While they were two of the biggest songs of Ja Rule's career at that point, Lil Mo then turned that success into records with artists like Jay-Z and the late Tupac. However, the singer didn't look back too fondly on her dealings with Ja, saying to MTV News, two hit record smashes, those two records ruled 2001. The whole world knows that." Not only did she claim that she wasn't paid for her contributions, but that she didn't even get a proper recognition, going on to say, "...I helped that brother sell three million records, and I don't have a plaque for the Rule 336 album. I did Parking Lot Pimpin', and Jay-Z sent me a plaque for every song he's done, a thank you card and a bottle of Chris." In 2005, Lil Mo decided to file a lawsuit against Ja Rule, Murder Inc. Records, and Def Jam for $15 million. While speaking at All Hip Hop, she claimed that she owns 10% of Put It On Me, saying, "...this is beyond personal. This is business. This is my livelihood as an artist. We don't make money until the label makes money, so as a songwriter, that was a part of my career that I was supposed to receive a substantial amount of money." Luckily, Lil Mo and Ja Rule did later reconcile and release another song together. In July 2007, Ja Rule joined Lil Wayne on stage during a concert in Manhattan. Later that evening, Ja was pulled over for speeding. Per CNN, police then found, hidden in the backseat of his Maybach, a loaded firearm with the serial number scratched off. "'Would you like to tell me why there was a gun in your car?' According to MTV News, the rapper pleaded guilty to attempted criminal possession of a weapon and was sentenced to two years in prison in 2010. While serving that time, Ja Rule was hit with tax evasion charges. Fox News reports that the rapper admitted to failing to pay taxes on over $3 million in earnings from 2004 to 2006. As a result, he was sentenced to 28 months in prison, most of which could be completed while serving his previous sentence. While addressing the court before his second sentencing, Ja Rule said, "...I in no way attempted to deceive the government or do anything illegal. I was a young man who made a lot of money. I'm getting a little choked up. I didn't know how to deal with these finances, and I didn't have people to guide me, so I made mistakes." Just 20 months into his two-year gun charge sentence, Ja Rule was released from prison, allowing him to finish the remaining time left on his tax evasion sentence on house arrest. I, I thought it was going to be a lot different, but when I got there, people actually had a lot of admiration for me, a lot of love for me. Yeah. You know, so, so it, was a, it was a really different experience. <laughs> In 2015, Ja Rule joined CEO Billy McFarland to help promote Magnesis, a fancy black card that allegedly came with special perks and VIP access for millennials. The rapper was named creative head and spokesman for the company and said of his business venture, "...we all have eyes, but not everyone has vision. You have to have that vision to see what's going to be hot tomorrow. I think that's what makes people great, being able to see what the public needs and wants tomorrow, not today." The card first opened for members in New York, then expanded into other other states across the country, according to Fortune. For $250 per year, members would gain entry to exclusive celebrity events, a concierge service to score hard-to-get concert tickets and restaurant reservations, and access to a swanky shared hangout pad. How the company made money was a mystery. The WeFunder page alleged it was mostly funded by membership fees, but a member of the Magnesis management team said it was fueled primarily by branded events. Ja Rule's role in the company was allegedly inflated as well. They gave him a role, like a title technically, but like just so when he was on camera, he would be associated with Magnesis. He had nothing to do with Magnesis. 
In the end, members began to complain about broken promises, overcharges, and bad business dealings per fortune. Magnesis earned an F grade with the Better Business Bureau, and that wasn't even their most famous failure. Magnesis CEO Billy McFarland told Rolling Stone that the plan for the ill-fated Fire Festival was hatched in early 2016 by himself and his business partner, Ja Rule. It all sounded amazing. They shot a beautiful promotional video that featured the likes of Bella Hadid and Emily Ratajkowski, promising yoga on the beach, water trampolines, sea bobbing, music, art, food, and $1 million of real treasure and jewels hidden around the island. The event also had a slick list of musical acts lined up, including Lil Yachty, Blank 182 and Migos. What guests got, however, was something much less than promised. Not long before the event's highly anticipated start in April 2017, the Wall Street Journal warned that some musical acts were not yet paid, and guests were worried about the lack of communication. According to Billboard, flights full of guests who'd paid up to $1,200 headed to Exumas were delayed, then canceled. Those who did make it to the island were met with disaster tent setups, given little support and fed with cheese on bread. Speaking with Rolling Stone, McFarland said, "...we were a little naive in thinking for the first time we could do this ourselves. Next year, we will definitely start earlier." By the following year, however, McFarland was slammed with a $100 million lawsuit and sentenced to six years in prison for fraud. His partner Ja Rule was deemed ignorant of the festival's wrongdoings in July 2019. Uh, biggest misconception about your involvement in Fire Festival is that I committed a crime. Okay. What did Machine Gun Kelly say about Eminem's teen daughter that got him in hot water? And why have some called him racist? Keep watching to find out that and more about the controversial star. Machine Gun Kelly is no stranger to making headlines for a slew of reasons. Whether it's with his surprising net worth or his decision to change his name, he's known for firing off eyebrow-raising tweets, but one of his most controversial came in 2012. That's when he decided to openly thirst over Eminem's daughter, Haley Jade, who was then 16. Tweeting that he had seen photos of her, he proclaimed, "...she is hot as f in the most respectful way possible, cause M is king." Well, Slim Shady saw nothing respectful about it, and according to Kelly, it affected his career. Speaking with Hot 97's Ebro in the Morning, Kelly claimed the tweet is the reason why some people won't listen to or review his album, and some places won't play his music. However, he was adamant he did nothing wrong, saying, "...I said she's beautiful, but all respect due. Eminem is king. What's wrong with that?" Is there a 15-year age gap where I said, I'm, I'm a creep for that? No. I was so wait, 21, what, dog. Wait, what? He was still addressing the tweet in 2018 when he told The Breakfast Club he didn't think his comment was disrespectful. However, he appeared to backtrack, saying he didn't actually know how old Haley was when he made his remarks. He also conceded, I'm a father, I have a nine-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. I get it, 100%. As for the person at the center of the drama, M's daughter, a source told Hollywood Life that she was not happy with the publicity. Machine Gun Kelly may be adamant that he meant nothing harmful by calling Eminem's then 16-year-old daughter hot, but that wasn't the only time he made questionable comments about underage girls. Rounding up receipts, the screenshot pointed to a string of problematic tweets that MGK has since deleted. In one, the rapper proclaimed, "...I wish 13, 14, 15-year-old girls weren't allowed to be hot so I wouldn't feel like such a creeper when I look at them." In another, he recounted meeting a 13-year-old who liked one of his tattoos and seemingly joked, "'Don't worry, though, y'all, I won't pull an R. Kelly.'" Equally problematic is a largely forgotten 2013 interview with Fuse in which a 23-year-old MGK called a 17-year-old Kendall Jenner his top celebrity crush. When asked if he was, quote, "'counting down the days until her 18th birthday,' he said no." "'I'm not waiting until she's 18, I'll go now." He then proceeded to defend himself, saying, "...I'm not like a creepy age." And she's like a celebrity, like, there, there is no, there is no limits right there. He talked about other celebrities, falsely claiming that they had dated teenagers, before going on. If Kendall Jenner is in your bedroom naked and you're 50, you're going. It's no secret that Eminem and Machine Gun Kelly dislike each other, but their feud runs deeper than MGK's infamous Haley tweet. Opening up about their long-standing beef in 2018, Eminem admitted to Sway that he was upset about Kelly talking about his daughter. However, he highlighted the real reason he dissed Kelly on his track Not Alike, 
It was back in 2015 when Kelly first made unproven claims that he had been banned from Eminem's Sirius XM hip-hop channel, Shade 45, because of said tweet. He said, I, I'm, a, I'm the greatest rapper alive since my favorite rapper banned me from Shade 45. Well, Slim Shady didn't appreciate that rumor being spread, and he unleashed his anger during the interview, saying, I don't give a f about your career. You think I actually f think about you? You know how many f rappers that are better than you? You're not even in the conversation. M was also rubbed the wrong way by Kelly's reported diss on Tech 9s track, No Reason. As he explained, it put him in a weird position because he felt he had to answer, but didn't want his response to give Kelly even more time in the spotlight. In the end, he went for it on Not Alike, and as he told Sway, he did hear Kelly's response to that rap devil. His thoughts? It didn't feel like a diss to me, it just felt like pitiful. Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox became Instagram official in July 2020, but according to new claims from the rapper's ex, model Summer Rae, he wasn't quite free to hook up with the actress when he did. Speaking on Logan Paul's Impulsive podcast in March 2021, the 24-year-old influencer said she dated MGK, but things didn't really go her way, claiming that she never had sex with Kelly because he didn't pass some kind of litmus test. And then Kelly cheated on her with Megan Fox. Opening up about Kelly's shady boyfriend behavior, she said he forbade her from attending his Bloody Valentine video shoot, which starred Fox, because of COVID-19-related restrictions, an excuse she no longer believes. What's more, she said she joined him and Fox for their Midnight in the Switchgrass movie shoot and waited in the hotel during the shoot, not suspecting a thing. While she didn't specify when she thinks the infidelity began, she's sure it had nothing to do with her strict rules. She mused, I think that even if I was having sex with him, he would still do that with Megan. In the end, though, she said she isn't mad about it. Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox got engaged in January 2022, launching a million memes and seriously mixed reaction to Fox's engagement ring. As the rapper explained on Instagram, the massive sparkler features their birthstones, an emerald and diamond, that were set on two magnetic bands of thorns that draw together. Machine Gun Kelly and Megan Fox are giving a whole new meaning mm. to Love Hurts. Speaking with Vogue days later, Kelly confirmed he wasn't kidding about the thorns, reiterating, the bands are actually thorns, so if she tries to take it off, it hurts. Love is pain. The design was surely meant to be romantic, but many didn't see it that way. Critics soon took to Twitter to suggest that it was problematic. One commentator joked, why not design the ring to look like an actual red flag? Ouch! Eminem isn't the only high-profile artist Machine Gun Kelly has sparred with. In February 2021, Slipknot frontman Corey Taylor appeared to throw shade at Kelly and his switch from rap to rock, telling Cutter's rock cast he hates, quote, "...artists who failed in one genre and decided to go rock, and I think he knows who he is." MGK waited until September to fire back during Chicago's Riot Fest, which he co-headlined with Slipknot. While on stage, he told fans he was happy he wasn't 50 years old and wearing a mask on stage. Kelly then took to Twitter to throw more dirt on Taylor, but it would backfire. Explaining that Taylor once recorded a verse for a song on Tickets to My Downfall, Kelly proclaimed, "...it was terrible, so I didn't use it." According to him, Taylor was mad about it. Well, that wasn't exactly the truth, and Taylor had receipts to prove it. Tweeting that Kelly was acting like a child, he explained, I didn't do the track because I don't like when people try to write for me. I said no to them. He also shared screenshots of text proving his side of the story. However, Kelly wouldn't admit he was wrong and, in a petty response, tweeted, "...basically, your verse was really bad. Respectfully, I was just telling you to rewrite it because it was really bad." Machine Gun Kelly's allegedly shady fan behavior was put on blast in May 2021 in a viral TikTok video posted by Emmy Lamp. Sharing a 2019 encounter she had with Kelly when she was 19, Lamp recalled how they met up in Cleveland. Showing screenshots as proof, Lamp said he liked one of her photos and DM'd her. They agreed to meet up, but soon, she was locked in a bathroom crying because he had called her dumb and weird and was cussing her out. Why? In a follow-up video, Lamp said they went to the diner and when he dropped his hat, she picked it up. Handing it to him, she accidentally called him sis, which reportedly triggered a barrage of insults. 
She said, maybe it's because we were in front of other people. He said it was disrespectful. I said I had to go to the bathroom and then I started crying and I left and we never saw each other again. Commenters backed her claims, with one writing, he does this to girls in the towns that he's playing at. As further evidence, one fan posted a photo of himself standing next to Kelly at Reading Festival in 2019 and shared how when he asked for a pic, Kelly ignored him. He went on, I asked again, he turned to me, looked me dead in the eye, and said, how many times I gotta tell you, mother just take the photo. Have fun, Megan Fox. Of all of the things that have landed Machine Gun Kelly in the headlines, his comments on the 2012 BET Awards red carpet topped the list. That's because, while doing an interview, Kelly thought it was the perfect time to talk about oral sex. More specifically, how he thinks black women in particular are great at it. Proclaiming he believes that women of color are too demure, he encouraged them to stop saying they don't do that unless they're dating someone and instead, show your skills cause black girls give the best 100%. Backlash was swift, with Madame Noir dubbing him an ignorant white boy. A Change.org petition was even launched, demanding Kelly be held accountable for his racist remarks towards black women by Interscope and Bad Boy Records. However, the terrible comments he made that day didn't end there. When one woman standing nearby overheard his speech, she walked away, sparking an unbelievable tirade from Kelly, who cursed at her and called her explicit names, commenting on her appearance in a derogatory way. In 2014, Kelly was asked about the racist comments during an interview with Vlad TV. Not one to back down, he stood firmly by what he said. And also, that's a compliment. Sadly, for some boy band veterans, life doesn't always go in one direction. Let's strip down the shady side of Liam Payne. While in One Direction, Zayn Malik and Liam Payne seemed to be the closest in the group. However, when Malik left the group in 2015, Payne was the most vocal about his displeasure. In 2017, after Malik revealed the mental and physical toll the grueling One Direction schedule took on him, Payne publicly dismissed it. He said in a Teen Vogue interview, One Direction was a wonderful, wonderful time in all of our lives. It was like uni, but on steroids. It was mad. It was madness. It was so much fun. I don't understand how you can come out of that experience and say the things that he says sometimes. The shade against Malik continued when Payne appeared on Logan Paul's Impulsive podcast in 2022. Payne took aim at Malik's relationship with Gigi Hadid, and his upbringing, Payne seemed to make light of Malik's alleged altercation with Yolanda Hadid and alluded to Malik's own parents being unsupportive of him. He said about his former friend, Your only hope, hope is that at some point in their life, the person on the other end of the phone wants to receive the help that you're willing to give them. Liam Payne not only took aim at Zayn Malik, but also bandmate Louis Tomlinson. Payne revealed that he and Tomlinson were total opposites who butted heads frequently. He said on the Impulsive podcast, Louis was wild, and he wanted to be wild, and he's, that's his spirit. And also, he's my best mate now, but in the band, we hated each other. Like, to come to blows, hate each other. And though he didn't name Tomlinson, Payne also described one moment when he and another unnamed bandmate got physical backstage. Yeah, there was an argument backstage, and someone, one ma member in particular, threw me up a wall. So I said to him, if you don't remove those hands, there's a high likelihood you'll never use them again. As the remaining members of One Direction kicked off their solo endeavors in 2016, they each expressed how supportive they were of each other. In 2017, when asked for thoughts on Harry Styles and Niall Horan's solo music careers, Liam Payne didn't hold back. He told Music Choice that Horan's debut songs were really cool, but described Styles' Sign of the Times as not his cup of tea. It's not my sort of music, so it's not something I'd, I'd, I'd listen to. That's the way I'd put it best, I think. Payne has also made it known he's not much of a fan of Styles' new fashion sense. In an interview with The Face, the singer implied that his former bandmate has drastically changed from his One Direction days to the point where he feels like a stranger. He said, I don't know what more I'd say to him other than, hello and how are you? I mean, look at the stuff I put out, and the stuff Harry puts out. Polar opposite. I'm like the Antichrist version of what Harry is. Payne's jabs didn't end there. When Glamour magazine asked which band member he'd left babysit, Payne passed on selecting styles. I couldn't rely on Harry because I feel like my child would come out dressed in something that I just wouldn't understand. 
while airing out all the One Direction dirty laundry to Logan Paul on the Impulsive podcast, Liam Payne also revealed what he considers the true origin story of the group. Payne alleges that Simon Cowell formed the group around him first. Payne had initially auditioned for X Factor at 14 years old, and Cowell eventually booted him off, but not before making a promise to Payne that in two years he'd help him make it big. Two years later, Payne returned, and before facing elimination again, Cowell selected him and four other boys to form a group. So he kind of started with my face and then worked around the, the, the rest. I've never told that story before. I was the honorary member of One Direction, yes. And he's told me that story himself. Payne even declared himself the most successful solo artist from the group. When speaking on his first solo single, Strip That Down, he made another claim that confused people. We did the first song, Billion Streams. I think it outsold everybody within the band and I was the last to go oh and I never God. expected that. This pop star beef has since been squashed, but Liam Payne and Justin Bieber had a shady back and forth that went on for years. The drama between the two singers started after Payne made reference to Bieber's past arrest in a Twitter spat with a fan. In 2015, a believer tweeted at Payne to let him know that he will never be more successful than the baby singer. Payne responded, How many times have I been arrested? In 2015, Bieber struck back against One Direction on Snapchat. As Bieber and One Direction prepared to drop albums on the same day, the rivalry sparked up again. Bieber posted a picture of him making a scared face on Snapchat and wrote, the face you make when you come out with an album the same day as Justin Bieber. In 2019, Payne explained to The Mirror that the long-standing beef between the two was put to rest after they spoke one-on-one -on -one and cleared the air. After a run-in with Liam Payne at the 2013 Brit Awards, singer Boy George blasted him on Twitter, claiming he was rude to him and his niece. He tweeted, Top marks to Harry Styles for stopping for a picture with my niece and boot to Liam and the disrespectful one of a minder. Payne responded back with a string of tweets defending himself writing, Now, now, boy, let's not tell porkies. Firstly, thanks for getting my name wrong three times, then asking me where is Liam? Awkward. Then when you finally got it right, saying you wanted Niall instead. He also took aim at George's style and wrote, can I borrow a hat and makeup for next Halloween? I'd love to look as scary as you. However, not all love was lost. In 2019, Payne appeared on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen and explained the misunderstanding. He revealed that the two have since made up and have laughed about their Twitter feud. Liam Payne welcoming a child in 2017 with singer Cheryl Cole shocked fans everywhere. In 2020, his approach to fatherhood made headlines. Payne revealed to Ting's magazine that he made a decision to take time away from his son, saying, But we discussed from the start, and for different reasons, me and Cheryl decided I should be away for a little bit. It's not unusual for me to be in and out of his life. He's quite a chill child. He doesn't worry about things too much. I had a, a, a job that somebody booked in by accident on, the, on his birthday, which I was like, this is terrible. I got the news, I was like, oh my goodness, this, Bad this is... Dad. Payne was then slammed as an absent father on social media. Payne retaliated by taking to his Instagram and called out clickbait articles. He wrote, Usually I let these things slide, but this is completely out of context. I couldn't see my son because of the worldwide pandemic that is happening, not because I had anything wrong with me like this headline hints at. Payne wasn't the only one unhappy with his interviews going viral. The Mirror reported that Cheryl Cole was left feeling upset and embarrassed after Payne went into too much detail about her birthing experience on the Impulsive podcast in 2022. The source claimed she was not a fan of his oversharing and had a serious discussion with him about privacy boundaries. Following the success of his debut single, Strip That Down, Liam Payne's follow-up song, Both Ways, was more of a miss. The song features Payne singing about getting intimate with a bisexual partner. Fans immediately called out the star on Twitter for lyrics that they believed fetishized bisexuality. The title of the song also caught flack. One fan wrote, Can we talk about how not only is both ways gross for the way it treats bisexual women as sex objects, but also the fact that the phrase liking both ways is a completely outdated and offensive way to describe being bisexual. Payne later addressed the controversy and apologized for the offensive lyrics. He claimed that he felt pressured to continue singing racy lyrics after the success of songs like Strip That Down. In an interview with Daily Star, the singer said, I am sorry to anyone who got offended by certain songs or different things on the album for sure. 
It was never my intention with any of the writing or things I was doing. I'd say the new music will be less sexy. I think I passed my time on that one anyway. The music I'm looking at now is a lot different. As a boy band member, Liam Payne is used to breaking hearts. His most recent relationship with Maya Henry got off to a publicized start. Henry was allegedly only 18 years old when the pair began dating, a claim that Payne and his team heavily refuted. In 2020, Payne confirmed that the two were engaged in an interview on Good Morning America. The relationship seemed to be going well until April 2022, when news broke that the two decided to break off their engagement. Just two days later, Payne was seen with a new girl on his arm and chaos ensued. As fans began bombarding Henry with questions, she was forced to issue a response. Underneath an Instagram photo of Payne and his new girlfriend, Aliana Mala. She wrote, I love all the fans so much, but please stop sending me these pictures of my fiancé wrapped around another woman. This is not me, and it's hard enough knowing this has happened without seeing it. Enough now. This only fueled rumors that Payne was caught cheating on her with Mala. After the story went viral, a rep for Mala spoke with E! News and denied that there was any overlap in the two relationships.